Yep, I, I just started recording, so you're good to go. You want me to start? I'm sorry. Yes, yep, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Hi, good afternoon. This is Lee Howard uh, from Diana T. Myers & Associates. Um, I am joined today on the call by Brendan Allman from uh, DCED and Maria Williams from the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Domestic Violence. And thanks for joining us for our um, best practices in serving survivors of domestic violence uh, uh, webinar um, it, per HUD uh, requirements and just best practice in general. Um, we're required to provide training at least once a year on, um, uh, on best practices uh, for serving uh, survivors of domestic violence. So this is uh, this year's training. Last year we uh, did a training uh, in September of 2018. Um, uh, was our first uh, for best practices uh, in serving DV. Um, uh, we also had um, Maria present as part of the annual pick count last year and really talked us through some good strategies for engaging folks who are fleeing or might be fleeing or might be experiencing domestic violence. Um, and then we did eligibility training back in March, um, and I know many of you also attended that. Um, today's content is going to be different from those. Uh, there's um, some overlap from the eligibility training just because we continue to get some questions, um, uh, but uh, most of the content for today um, is specific to this year's training. Next slide, please. Um, I just want to give a little quick housekeeping. Um, everyone is muted, so please keep yourself muted. Um, the recording, the, the webinar is being recorded, and I will have that posted to the workplace and the website uh, later this afternoon. If you do have any questions, though, and you are uh, in Skype, you can type into the chat box, and uh, we will answer your questions accordingly. Sorry, Lee. No, thank you. Um, so this is just a quick um, overview of today. We're going to, this is our introduction, obviously. Uh, Maria is going to talk about um, best practices. Uh, we are both going to talk a little bit about eligibility, and then uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the COC's emergency transfer plan, and a little broader than that to include um, uh, HUD's WAWA final rule. Um, next slide, please. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Maria. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, if you do have questions as we go, Leah and I will do our best to answer them. Um, so please engage with us in the chat box, um, because then we'll be able to tailor um, the presentation to your needs and the training to your needs as we go. Uh, next slide. So my role at PCADV is to connect um, the domestic violence providers that are members of PCADV to the housing homelessness um, work that is going on to housing homeless providers and to the COC. Um, I wanted to make sure that we are all working with the same definition of domestic violence. And this is the definition of domestic violence that PCADV uses. When um, we're doing trainings in person, um, we know that domestic violence can be um, explained in many different ways. And so this isn't a static definition, um, but it is one that will help us all, I think, understand um, who we're looking to serve and how to identify survivors of domestic violence better. So DV is a, power, is a pattern of power and control of, excuse me, is a pattern of coercive behavior used by one person to gain power and control over another in an intimate or familial relationship. One of the questions I get a lot is if domestic violence is just intimate partner, and what we support here at PCADV is that it is intimate partner violence, but it is also familial violence, um, and that that can exist in many different ways. Um, there are lots of terms that can be used um, instead of domestic violence, like intimate partner violence or family spousal relationship or dating violence, um, battering, um, just abuse. Um, it can be referred to in lots of different ways. There is no incorrect way to describe it. Um, 
I know that we often get hung up on language and it's important to be able to talk about this in a way that isn't so language focused, but is more contextual and person focused. Um, and in relation to that, um, I use the term survivor um, and uh, or person who is experiencing abuse um, rather than victim because I work um, in the survivor, um, I work with survivors, I work in the survivor advocacy field, which is what we call it in the domestic violence field, doing advocacy work with survivors, um, which in housing homelessness work pretty much translates to case management. Um, but if you are working with um, a medical provider or um, in the legal field, the, the term victim is often used, and many of our member programs use the term victim. Um, Neither is right or wrong. Um, the best way to know how to refer to a survivor is to ask them what they would like to be called. Um, but I'm going to use the term survivor throughout the training. Um, there's one piece where we talk a little bit about legal, um, a legal definition and um, or a, a definition defined by an attorney more specifically. So we'll use the term victim then. Um, so according to the CDC, we, uh, these are pretty familiar statistics, one in four women and one in seven men have experienced physical abuse from an abusive intimate partner. While that is compelling, where this really connects to our work is that 80% of homeless families report domestic violence in their past and 50% cite domestic violence as the cause of their current episode of homelessness. So. Um, a couple things we know domestic violence is sort of historically underreported that many people experience dv without ever having told anyone and we know that homelessness is a direct result of domestic violence and so these numbers are actually probably low um, what is important to remember is you are serving survivors in your program if you work with anyone you have worked with survivors and what we want to do is make sure you have the tools to do that well um, it also, um, domestic violence really, um, and the experience of domestic violence really connects to homelessness in that, um, and back in the, the first part of the definition talks about coercive behavior. And coercive behavior and coercion often looks like push-pull behavior that a, an abusive partner will, will pull a survivor in and um, do things that make them stay, and then will push them away and, and not want them. Um, to stay and that um, push-pull is confusing and it is controlling and it also can result in an abusive partner um, controlling finances and holding that over a survivor's head which then wouldn't allow them to leave and be able to sustain housing on their own. Um, it could be housing in general that an abusive partner is holding over someone's head. It could be children and access to children. Um, and so there are all sorts of reasons why survivors stay. Um, what we want to make sure is that we never are putting in survivors in situations where they have to choose between being homeless or being in an abusive relationship. Um, because of control of finances and possessions and all of that, we can see how um, that could happen. And we all have stories about how that has happened. Um, so it's really important that we address that connection and know that in the West COC, we can't work to end homelessness without also working to end domestic violence because the two are so intertwined. Next slide, please. So um, domestic violence can look like a lot of things, as we've said, and financial abuse, like we've talked about, is mentioned here. Um, it's important to remember that um, Physical abuse is sometimes the least of the things that a survivor is impacted by. Um, many survivors that I've worked with over the years who have been um, badly injured by partners have said to me, um, you know, the physical abuse was bad, that may have landed them in the hospital or may have ultimately been the thing that forced them to leave, um, but oftentimes because they were afraid that the physical abuse was then going to translate to their children. Um, but the things that really stick with survivors are emotional abuse and lack of access to finances and being um, using uh, gaslighting techniques around that. So uh, gaslighting means that, you know, an, an abusive partner could say, 
of course you have access to the money and of course you can you can take whatever you need and then a survivor goes to do that and she doesn't have access to the bank account and he's you know the, the abuse partner has changed uh, the way that they can access the bank account and then she goes back to him and says I actually can't get in what you know what can be done and he said well I never told you you could you can you don't have access to that money um, that's an example of how gaslighting works and how gaslighting can really keep somebody controlled um, and with the the inability to ch actually choose to leave because there's nowhere for them to go um, so it's issues like that it's emotional abuse it's the constant put downs and objectification the survivor's experience that really sticks with them. So although physical violence is a manifestation of DV and we see that often, it's often not the thing that is the most impactful to the survivor. So when we are looking to serve survivors and when we're looking to um, help survivors be eligible for housing resources, focusing on physical violence is actually um, not always helpful because many survivors never experience physical violence, but the violence they do experience is directly connected and the control they do experience is directly connected to their homelessness or housing instability. Next slide, please. So um, PCADV is um, prioritizing uh, the domestic violence housing first model of service uh, and service provision um, for the entire state of Pennsylvania. And uh, that was part of the reason that my position was created and um, was created in direct response to needs that were identified by our member programs and many of those member programs in the West. Um, so, Domestic Violence Housing First was innovated by programs in uh, Washington, D.C., in Oregon, and in Washington State because there was an identified need that there need uh, to alternative ways to the traditional model of um, serving survivors. And that traditional model often looks like a survivor calling a hotline and then being told they need to come into emergency shelter, therefore making them homeless. Um, and then exiting that emergency shelter without any resources to um, have a sustainable housing plan or to know where they're going or to even be able to afford uh, permanent housing. Um, we know that once a family becomes homeless, and even if that homelessness does take place in a domestic violence shelter, the former are likely to become homeless again. The domestic violence housing first model looks at options and opportunities just for survivors to bypass um, emergency shelter altogether to make sure that they're getting their needs met and being able to keep their family together. Um, and one of the things that's often talked about in that is that, you know, uh, an emergency shelter, a domestic violence emergency shelter is supposed to be confidential and safe. And sometimes that safety is what's really needed. And that's absolutely true. But what we also know is the majority of people in a community, particularly in small rural communities, know where the domestic violence shelter is. It's often on a piece of donated land that's behind a church with a giant fence around it and security cameras and all of these things. So it's pretty obvious. And we like to joke and say that, you know, every church lady in uh, rural America knows where their local DV shelter is because she's going to go drop off quilts there. And so once once one person knows where the DV shelter is, everyone knows where the DV shelter is. And so um, this idea of a confidential building is really a flawed one. It's necessary, um, but it can't be the only solution to helping survivors get safe. It's fantastic because in the West COC, there's a well-established um, sort of frame for permanent housing for survivors. Organizations like CAPSI, Mercer Aware, Voice, and the Crisis Shelter of Lawrence County, just to name a few, um, have uh, permanent housing options for survivors already. Um, but what PCDV really wants to do is support those programs in growing in the ways that they've identified they need to, to best serve survivors in their communities, and then add additional resources, uh, both through COC funding and through partnerships uh, with other funded providers um, through and through more flexible funding to work for prevention and diversion of homelessness with survivors. Um, because we often know that that can be the safest thing if a survivor can retain housing um, rather than having to become homeless to get safe. That's often, that's a pretty flawed concept and not necessary for everyone. <laughs> Next slide, please. 
one of the things that survivors have told me over the years is that the rental assistance money is fantastic or the the diversion money that helped them stay out of shelter was fantastic or the you know the fact that we were able to pay their utility bill that they owed uh, money on for months was great but what really made the difference was having an advocate um, or a DV counselor walk alongside them in the process and um, help them identify what was going to work best for them. So a core component of Domestic Violence Housing First is survivor-driven trauma-informed services. And Jill Davies, who's an attorney in Connecticut, um, wrote a fantastic book called Domestic Violence Advocacy. And in that book, she, um, she really defines what victim-defined advocacy or survivor-driven advocacy means. And it doesn't mean that, you know, we as providers just um, because it's survivor driven or client driven or victim defined, however you want to say it, um, just sort of let them go with whatever they want to do. Um, that's not our job. Our job is to make sure that we're asking what they want and need and then providing them relevant resources to make sure that they can meet those goals and also saying to them, um, you know, this may, um, I, I've, I've talked with other people who have done this sort of thing in the past and here's what's worked and here's what hasn't, if they need ideas about how to best stay safe, or if they're making a choice that um, you are concerned about uh, because of safety or other reasons, um, speaking with them about how um, you're concerned for them and um, helping them um, sort of talk about why they're making the choice they're making and what impacts it's having for themselves and their family. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So the second piece of that is trauma-informed services, which I know there's been extensive training on in the COC, but um, it's, you know, it's really looking at how trauma impacts everyone we serve, but particularly survivors of domestic violence. Um, and making sure that we're not having anything in place in our programs that could re-traumatize them and that everything that we're doing supports healing and resiliency of the individual and the family and addresses the root cause of abuse and violence um, rather than just sort of skimming over the top and hoping that we can move a family on quickly. Next slide. So there are really three core components and um, best practices for serving survivors in your programs, and that's safety, confidentiality, and using trauma-informed services. Um, we don't at all expect housing providers to become experts in domestic violence. There's no way that you can. Um, I mean, some of you are, and that is fantastic, but um, the majority of you aren't because you're doing really incredible work in other sectors. And we know you're serving survivors, but um, you don't need to be an expert in safety planning to serve survivors. The best thing that you can do is, first of all, rely on what the survivor is telling you that they need and what has kept them safe in the past. Um, and being willing to dig in and have that conversation with them rather than being afraid that you don't know enough. And so you avoid the conversation, which I've worked with many providers who have really wrestled with that. And if you need support, um, you can always reach out to me and we can problem solve those things together. But even more importantly, building a relationship with your uh, local domestic violence program is where you're really going to get the most support. Um, so if you're working with a survivor, certainly asking them if they'd like to be connected with their local domestic violence agency um, or your local domestic violence program is fantastic and they may or may not want that and there's no requirement that they need to. Um, but what they may need um, is for you to get support around serving them. And that's absolutely something you can do um, with your local DV agency is just call and have a peer-to-peer -peer conversation about what's going on without giving any sort of identifying information and getting ideas about strategizing for safety planning and other meeting needs um, that have come up that the survivor has identified. So really building a relationship with your local DV agency is essential. And if you um, are struggling with that, you please reach out to me. I can help build those connections. 
Um, or if you are needing something that is um, a sort of a quick turnaround and your local domestic violence agency is busy, um, feel free to give me a call and I can help problem solve those things too. The second piece is confidentiality and making sure that a survivor knows you're not going to share their story with anyone, um, that they're not, you're not going to enter any uh, identifiable information into HMIS. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you're also not going to um, press a survivor to share more than they're comfortable sharing. Um, when you're working with survivors, it's important to remember, even though sometimes the stories you hear are pretty horrific and it's hard to believe, um, that a survivor doesn't have to share their story with you at all. Um, what they need to say is that I have been, you know, a victim of domestic violence. I have been surviving sexual assaults. I have, you know, and, and they may work with you to help even identify that, but it's not, um, any provider's business, um, the details of that story. Um, and so getting comfortable with not knowing the details, but trusting the survivor that they know their story and they can hold it and giving them resources to tell their story if they need to um, with safe therapists in the community or other uh, support groups through your local domestic violence program, uh, that sort of thing can be really helpful. Um, and in that, because you um, often do hold these stories, um, it's important to remember not just trauma-informed services um, for the folks you're working with, but also what the impact trauma is having on you as a provider and um, making sure that you have a place where you can metabolize and process that um, without giving any identifying information, but um, being willing to have uh, support around you that can help you move through those stories in ways that don't impact your work, either with that survivor or others that you may um, come in contact with. Next slide. And Marie, there, there actually was a, Maria, there was a question um, from the Community Counseling Center asked, as a general assessment center, what do we do when a client cannot or will not work with the DV provider in our area? Should mm -hmm. they be entered into HMIS through the general entry we have access to, or do they have to go through the DV provider? That's a really great question. Um, and that's something that uh, there is a, a group of DV providers that has become a coordinated entry uh, DV services committee in the West COC, and this is something that we've talked about. Um, one of the things that I think needs to be identified in the West coordinated entry system is um, how a uh, who someone uh, someone that is working um, as a general assessment center can enter a, a DV, um, de-identified um, client into the system without involving the DV provider, because as we said, survivors don't have to work with the DV provider, but they should still have the right to have their information de-identified in HMIS. Um, so if a survivor says that they don't mind having identifiable information in HMIS, um, they feel like that's not a safety risk of them, then you should move ahead. Um, but if they say, I don't want to work with the DV agency and I don't um, want to have identifiable information in HMIS, then the general assessment centers ought to be able to, um, to do a de-identified uh, entry. I... Um, we've had conversations in our work group about how that could work, and we have hit some dead ends. Um, I'm hoping that that can be something that we can tackle and have a more concrete answer for. Um, the other thing that will be helpful is that um, LCAP, uh, Lawrence County, just um, put out an RFP, and the crisis shelter responded to the RFP to have a staff person um, working across the West COC um, that is a domestic violence staff person, um, but is working at the intersection of domestic violence and coordinated entry. So while that person will be an employee of the crisis shelter, um, they won't... Um, interact in the same manner with the um, the staff. Um, they're sort of working for all of us, really. Um, 
And uh, we're doing that in the East COC right now, and it's working well. And we wanted to do that in the West, too, to make sure that if there are situations like this that arise, that person can also intervene um, and help make sure that um, de-identified information um, and a confidential intake into the system is done. Um, but I am still hopeful that the general assessment centers could do that. And if anyone on the webinar has any information about a general assessment center being able to do that, um, please, please share with us. Great. Um, all right, we're gonna move into the eligibility uh, portion of the webinar. Um, thanks for reviewing those best practices. Um, <clears throat> Uh, again, for those of you who attended the uh, eligibility training that we did uh, back in March, some of this will be repetitive, but I think it's A, worth repeating. I know some folks were not uh, able to attend that, and uh, as I mentioned, I know that we continue to get questions uh, and calls uh, specific to this. Um, so just as a quick reminder for everybody, I think everybody knows this, but just in case, um, the HUD homeless definition under the HEARTH Act includes four categories of homelessness. Um, uh, briefly, category one um, is sort of classified as literally homeless. This really means folks who are either in shelter or in an unsheltered situation. So um, just using the pit count as a, a reference point for talking about who's literally homeless, that's who we count for the pit count. So it's folks who are um, sleeping in tents or under bridges, in cars, um, uh, you know, on the street, uh, um, as, as sort of HUD talks about it. Um, all of those kind of folks in those uh, types of situations are considered to be unsheltered. Um, in shelter includes folks in emergency shelters, um, which would include domestic violence shelters. It would also include folks who are um, uh, receiving hotel motel assistance, meaning uh, not from friends or family or from their own resources, but rather than being in shelter or uh, in an unsheltered situation, they're being housed temporarily in a hotel or motel um, uh, with that being paid for through charitable or government uh, types resources. Um, category two uh, is typically talked about for folks who are at risk of homelessness um, uh, and have uh, um, uh, imminent uh, documentation around uh, 14 days until they are uh, going to be homeless, um, which sort of raises it to like that imminent risk type of situation. Um, uh, category three, uh, no, none, no federal dollars, meaning uh, ESG or COC, um, can focus on category three at this point, um, uh, not just uh, within the Western PACOC, but also uh, nowhere in the country or, or, or is, has HUD given authority for uh, ESG or COC funding uh, to be for category three. Th those folks include um, for example, children and youth that are covered under um, the McKinney-Vento education definition, um, they may be covered under food stamps um, as homeless, uh, other, category, um, other uh, resources like that, but not uh, under HUD. And then finally, category four, fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence. Next slide, please. So um, program eligibility, just at a quick glance, um, uh, if you're operating an emergency shelter, unless it's otherwise uh, dictated by your funding source, you can certainly serve folks who are in need of shelter, who are in any of those categories. Transitional housing is able to serve categories one, two, and four. Um, rapid categories one and four, and that's just a moment of pause. Um, if you are a only receiving ESG funding um, for rapid rehousing, uh, somebody has to be literally homeless. So, of course, it could be a survivor of domestic violence, um, but that individual would have to be in shelter or in an unsheltered situation to receive ESG-funded rapid rehousing. For COC-funded, um, they do not have to be in uh, a shelter or an unsheltered situation. We're going to talk more uh, through the next several slides about that fleeing and attempting to flee definition and how that applies there. And for permanent supportive housing, 
Um, obviously, they have to have a disabling condition um, and either be literally homeless or a Category 4 attempting to flee or fleeing. Um, I will just add that, uh, as many of you know, the Western PCOC prioritizes chronically homeless for all uh, permanent deportive housing openings. And one of the things that um, was asked during the eligibility training is how do you document um, eligibility uh, for permanent supportive housing um, as chronic if the, fo if the household is Category 4? Um, great question. I have submitted that uh, question to HUD back when uh, we had this training. We had it uh, with you all uh, in March and with the Eastern COC back in May, and I have yet to get uh, a response to HUD from this question. So more information and guidance coming out about that once it's made available to us. The, the real important takeaway from this slide is really just to demonstrate that regardless of what type of program that you're operating, um, folks who are fleeing domestic violence category four are eligible under all types um, uh, with that caveat for rapid rehousing, ESG funded rapid rehousing. Um, but beyond that, all, um, all categories uh, are eligible for category four. Next slide, please. So um, this is the, the technical definition of Category 4, fleeing or attempting to flee um, domestic violence. So um, if you think back about our um, definition of domestic violence, it's really important to note here that um, when we say domestic violence, we don't just mean physical violence, which is really this definition um, kind of lends itself to just assuming um, physical violence, but in fact, it is not. So. Um, flee domestic violence um, and dating violence, sexual assault, stalking, or other dangerous or life-threatening conditions, which we'll talk about. Um, and then uh, we also know now um, from HUD that this uh, that people who are fleeing human trafficking also qualify as homeless under Category 4, which is fantastic, um, because we know that uh, that is something that a lot of us in Pennsylvania are beginning to look at. and. Um, housing for survivors of human trafficking is um, something that PCADV is working to prioritize, and we will have more training about human trafficking coming up uh, next year. So um, it, it's important to pull apart, pull this apart a little bit. Um, in fleeing, we understand that that means that they have left, um, but attempting to flee, um, a survivor could call from uh, the home that they currently rent um, with their abusive partner, even though they are still sleeping in their own bed, um, or the, the home that where they currently have a mortgage, even though they are still sleeping in their own bed, and um, are needing to leave, which means attempting to flee, um, but they don't have any resources to do so. Um, so even though they are currently housed, they would still be considered homeless and still be eligible for homelessness assistance under Category 4. Um, it's also uh, the second piece of this is having no other residents, and we'll talk more about that on the next slide. Um, but it's uh, important to remember that um, the idea of being doubled up or couch surfing um, a survivor is still considered homeless. Um, because they, uh, we know that a lot of survivors don't go to emergency shelter immediately. They may go, say, with a family member or with a friend, um, and that is not their permanent residence, and they don't want wish it to be their permanent residence. Um, oftentimes, it's not safe for it to be um, where they continue to stay, or um, the the person that they are staying with has a lease where uh, they would be in violation if more folks stayed with them. They have a voucher where they can't have more people stay with them, these sorts of things. Um, or the survivor just identifies that this isn't what they want. It's not going to be what's good for their family. They still can, they're still considered homeless under Category 4. And then also lacking the resources or support networks to obtain other permanent housing. So lacking the resources um, often translates to financial abuse. And although a survivor may have an income and they may have 
um, income within the household, they may not have access to any of that income, um, which would be an important thing to ask um, someone as they are attempting to flee or they have reached out for support. Um, and then uh, one of the, the hallmarks of domestic violence is isolation. And oftentimes an abusive partner will keep a survivor very isolated from themselves and or from their families and from their friends and their community to the point where the community um, and families oftentimes just sort of give up on the survivor, not because, you know, they, they don't want more for them, but because they really have been um, not allowed to be in contact. Um, so that is um, really um, impactful when a survivor is wanting to leave because not only do they not have um, places where they could go temporarily, they oftentimes aren't even, um, haven't been able to access the systems by which they could um, obtain housing. So they may have met their abusive partner when they were 17 or 18 and have lived with their abusive partner ever since then. And this may be 10 or 15 years later. They've never rented on their own. They don't even know how to begin to sign a lease. There may be language barriers. There could be mobility barriers, all sorts of things that would keep a survivor um, from having the resources to be able to obtain uh, permanent housing. Next slide. So we know that the concept of fleeing can look different for every survivor because every survivor situation is different. Um, and it's important that a housing provider or domestic violence advocate can ask questions to help a survivor um, think about um, their situation and to help an individual think about their situation if they're not even identifying as a survivor. But from you know, a basic conversation, you can tell that there may be some coercion occurring. Um, so these are um, some examples that uh, could be asked, um, but really uh, when you are working with a survivor, there is never any harm, or you're working with someone you may even assume may be a survivor. If you have them by themselves, um, there is no harm in asking them if somebody is um, doing something to make them feel unsafe. Um, that is never something that I would recommend if you are working with a couple or with, um, you know, children that are old enough to understand what's going on. Um, I would recommend um, finding a way to get the head of household um, on their own to be able to have that conversation. Uh, but there's never harm in asking. Um, so it's you won't know how to move forward and how to help the individual if you don't ask the question. Um, one of the things that we're going to continue to talk about at PCEV is how to help identify or how to help housing providers identify folks that are going through, um, that are dealing with human trafficking, that are surviving human trafficking. Um, and a great way to ask about that is, um, did someone make them uh, or ask them to do something that made them unsafe or uncomfortable in order to continue to stay in their home. Um, many times traffickers will uh, use the threat of homelessness to keep a survivor um, doing things uh, for the trafficker. Um, and so that's a direct link between human trafficking and homelessness so that we really want to make sure that people know how to ask and how to help. Um, and then also, if they're not even worried about their own safety, but they are worried about their children's safety or the safety of their pets, um, these are important indicators that uh, violence is escalating in the home and that they would qualify for, um, they would be eligible under category four. Next slide. So we, in terms of, of fleeing, um, you know, as Maria mentioned, uh, the definition talks about has no other residence. Um, and upon, you know, uh, the collaboration uh, that's been created um, between the COC and PCDV, um, and talking in more detail about this definition with Maria and sort of hearing uh, her interpretation of it, um, you know, I had a skeptical eyebrow raise, you know, uh, it, how is it possible that for every possible resource that, that uh, folks have access to, um, there's a different threshold uh, and, and documentation requirements 
uh, uh, needed for for folks than for domestic violence. Um, so it, my typical response in those situations is to ask HUD. Um, so of course I did, uh, and uh, it's at the back of the PDF um, uh, that includes the PowerPoint, if you have that. Uh, there's the full response that we received from HUD, um, uh, both this 129735 and 129902. Um, both of those questions should be attached to the PowerPoint. Um, but basically what HUD uh, did was to confirm that Maria was correct, um, that a household would meet Category 4 of the definition if they are fleeing or attempting to flee from domestic violence, meet all the requirements regardless of where they are residing, including staying with family and friends. For all the reasons that Maria uh, just sort of walked us through, and I'm sure any other specific circumstances, um, uh, the fact that uh, they may be in a doubled up situation um, uh, would not uh, uh, restrict their eligibility uh, for homeless assistance through uh, COC funding. So just wanted to sort of put that out there for all of you who operate funding, who are thinking to yourself, listening to Maria talk, well, this is counter to what we know. It is counter to what we know, um, but nonetheless, it is uh, um, true and correct. So uh, wanted to make sure folks had access to that information um, uh, directly from HUD that sort of validates that and provides far more information than what's just put on this, this slide 14 here. Next slide, please. I really love it when HUD says that I'm correct. Um, so the other thing that uh, the providers, the domestic violence providers in the West COC have done this past year is helped PCADV develop a document that um, has been published in collaboration with the National Network to End Domestic Violence that outlines all of this specifically. So um, we took the, the wealth of information that you all have in the West COC and turned it into a national document that is informing the conversation. And so I have deep appreciation for the DV providers in the West. Um, what we did was take examples that were given um, by people that some of you may have worked with um, and put them into a document to really talk about what fleeing means and what it could look like. That document was sent out um, in, in conjunction with the PowerPoint. Um, and so please um, use it, print it, hang it on your wall. Um, I'm happy to talk through it with you. And like I said, may, many of the DV providers in your community helped inform that document, and so they will also be able to speak to that document with you. Um, and we all want to make sure that we're, we are functioning from the same place, uh, the same definition, functioning with the same definition of fleeing, um, because that's what will really make a big difference in impacting uh, the homelessness of survivors in the West COC. Um, so the other thing that that document outlines is dangerous and life-threatening. <clears throat> Um, that is um, language like that we just talked about is in category four, um, but is um, sort of inflammatory language and language that was not recommended by the uh, national DV community um, when category four was being developed. Um, but nonetheless, it was put in there. Um, and since then, HUD has had to clarify that they didn't mean that any provider should be telling a survivor whether or not they are in danger. Um, domestic violence providers don't tell survivors whether or not they are in danger. Survivors define that for themselves. Um, the caveat to that is that if a survivor is discussing what's going on with them and they don't find what they're doing to be dangerous, um, is certainly something that we can do um, as providers is step in and say, that seems really dangerous to me. Can you tell me more about what you're doing? But it is not our responsibility to define what um, dangerous or life-threatening conditions mean. Um, it shouldn't be construed to um, make someone eligible or ineligible for under Category 4. And um, HUD also identified that um, interpersonal violence is inherently dangerous. And so we talked about what interpersonal violence means, what domestic violence means. That, just, that, that doesn't just mean physical violence. That doesn't mean visible bruises. 
Um, it could mean that, but it could also mean a whole host of other things that you're never going to see that can be just as dangerous and life-threatening. So um, please take that into consideration when you're working with survivors that they define what dangerous and life-threatening means and that um, any instance of interpersonal violence, violence is in fact dangerous and life-threatening. Next slide. So for those of you who were on Skype, um, I just provided the link to the document uh, that uh, was being referenced by Maria. If you are not on uh, the Skype and just listening and using the PowerPoint to follow along, um, this document was sent via email uh, um, a couple of, uh, I think a week ago. Um, uh, it's called, uh, the email went out December 11th, um, just as a point of reference if you're looking for it. Um, it's called Category 4, Hearth Homeless Des Designation Fleeing or Attempting to Flee Domestic Violence, Dating Violence, Sexual Assault, Stalking, and Human Trafficking. It's a snappy title, so um, hopefully uh, you can find that. Um, uh, but wanted to make sure folks had um, access to that. It is uh, available on the COC website, uh, and it's linked there in the chat box. Um, just sort of moving on from that to documentation of homelessness. We're not going to spend a lot of time um, on this, but uh, wanted to just um, specifically uh, touch upon a couple of points uh, re related to the documentation here. Sorry, I was um, answering a question in the chat box. So um, before we move on, um, the question was, is what types of dangerous and life-threatening situations do not qualify? Um, so I said that if the conditions don't have to do with interpersonal or domestic violence, um, and then there was an example of would f uh, feeling unsafe because of a neighbor's drug dealing qualify. Um, I'm going to say no, um, because this wasn't designed to support, um, th there's no act of, of violence occurring there. Um, it is certainly a person has every right to feel unsafe, but um, that would be something that they would need to address with their landlord um, and other systems involved. Um, I don't think that that would qualify them under Category 4. Um, but the second piece of that is what about a non-familial, non-relational roommate who verbally harasses them? Um, this could qualify, and if there are other DV providers on the call, um, I would love to hear from you about um, whether or not you have qualified folks under Category 4 um, for roommate situations. Um, the, the thing is, is that we're looking at two people in a relationship then, um, and the relationship doesn't have to be romantic. Um, but they are in a relationship because they are living together. Um, we also know that roommates can be a whole lot of things to people, and so um, we wouldn't want someone to have to, for example, out themselves um, to get services. Um, so um, I would certainly qualify. I would talk with the person more, but I would certainly make somebody eligible under Category 4 for um, verbal harassment from a roommate, uh, but also if there are other DV providers or whomever on the line that um, have thoughts about that, that would be great. Um, uh, this is a really great example of how sort of um, malleable this definition is. Um, we want it to work to bring people into services rather than to exclude them from, um, but we also want to make sure that the people that are eligible under Category 4 are experiencing relational interpersonal violence of, of some sort, and it's not being used um, simply because a person is feeling unsafe due to a person they don't have a relationship with. Um, one of the things that has been confusing about even what I just said is that um, in cases of sexual assault, 
you, um, the sexual assault survivor, may not have a relationship with um, the person who assaulted them, um, but it still would qualify under, you still would be eligible for services under category four um, because of the nature of the assault. Um, so it is confusing, it's complex. Um, the document provided helps think through some of that, but I also am always happy to um, think through these situations with you. Um, you can reach out to me anytime to do so, um, and your local DV provider can do the same. I know you just asked that you wanted to hear from any uh, DV providers on the line. I'm certainly not that, but I'm going to just um, echo uh, your response to say that I, I don't think that somebody who is feeling unsafe uh, because of neighborhood drug dealing would qualify for the same reasons that you mentioned. The one thing I would say about the non-familial, non-relational roommate situation is that the the individual would still have to meet the other parts of Category 4. As Maria pointed out, there's ands there. Um, and so, uh, you know, depending on uh, the circumstances, um, if that individual has no other residence and lacks the resources um, to obtain other permanent housing, um, you know, those are still two conditions that would need to be um, at play for that household or that individual to to qualify under Category 4. Um, so it, it wouldn't just be any situation with a roommate. They would still have to um, uh, lack those resources, et cetera. Thank you. So for documentation, um, for the, and this is for victim service providers specifically, um, to document Category 4 eligibility in someone's file, um, all you need is an oral statement uh, from the individual um, stating that they are fleeing, they have no subsequent residence, and they lack resources. Um, the statement then is documented by a self-certification form or a certification form by the intake worker. Um, what we have found works in a forehead documentation in the past is a very simple form that can go in someone's file um, where they say, um, yes, I am homeless due to domestic violence. It's that simple and um, they sign it, and then the domestic violence um, caseworker also signs it. Um, so it's not to be overthought. It's a really simple process, and if you are a victim service provider and you would like an example of that form, please reach out to me. I'm happy to share one with you. Um, I also imagine that your local DV organization has one that they'd be happy to share, um, but if if you uh, or a surrounding DV organization has one, they'd be happy to share, but I'm also happy to um, help folks out with that. Next slide. Okay, so if you're not a victim service provider, you've got more uh, more documentation requirements than, uh, than victim service providers. Um, uh, similarly, oral statement by the individual or head of household seeking assistance that they are fleeing. Um, the statement is documented by self-certification or by the caseworker. So that's pretty similar. Um, where it varies is that where the safety of the household is not jeopardized. So if it's safe to do these things, the oral statement uh, given by the, the individual or household that's fleeing must be verified. Um, and we're going to talk about the verification in just a minute. Um, next slide, please. So it says verified and certification by the individual or head of household that no subsequent residence has been identified and self-certification or other written documentation that the individual or family lacks the financial resources and support networks to obtain other permanent housing. So some of those things like certification about no other residence and certification about lack of financial resources um, some of you may already include um, documentation requirements that sort of speak to those two um, bullet points. What you may not have documentation around is uh, the safety of the, um, uh, the, the fact that the household is fleeing. 
examples of, of what can be used for um, that part of the documentation. Again, when the household, um, when this doesn't jeopardize the safety of the household, um, could be, for example, a letter from the DV agency if they have worked with the DV agency in the past or are currently working with, um, a protection from abuse order um, if they have one of those, a PFA, a police report, it could be a hospital report, something like that to, uh, um, as a form of verification. I will just sort of put a caveat on that to say um, that if you are uh, looking to enroll uh, someone into your program who does not have, for example, a protection from abuse order or a police report or hospital report and doesn't have a relationship um, with the DV agency, I would encourage you to be um, creative and thoughtful and have a problem-solving conversation um, with the survivor about how you may be able to verify um, uh, their domestic violence. And part of that is because, you know, under Housing First, um, it's certainly uh, not permissible to deny uh, um, uh, services to folks who are survivors uh, uh, based on, on not having that type of documentation. Uh, what I mean by that is we, we can't limit uh, uh, assistance uh, to survivors who have a protection from abuse order in place um, if they don't think that the protection from abuse order is, is what they need to be safe. Um, and so uh, I just want to encourage folks to, to find that sort of balance between fulfilling your documentation requirements, which is, of course, important um, and a necessity, uh, but with being flexible and creative around finding documentation sources that both do not jeopardize the safety of the survivor um, and are available. Next slide, please. So I, I just want to reiterate that um, a, a person's signed oral statement is really the the, the best thing to go by, and um, getting a you know a signed form from a victim service provider is going to be easiest, um, and it should not be reason to not bring people into shelter or into your excuse me into your housing program. Um, because we really want to emphasize that the safety of the household is not jeopardized. And the last thing that we want to do is jeopardize the safety of the household because they don't have anywhere to live. Um, so domestic violence can be complicated. It is often messy. It is often nonlinear. Um, and if you are needing support and working with uh, bringing in survivors to your program, that's something that we can definitely help you with. So... Um, Rebecca and her two children are currently staying in a DV shelter, and they were referred to HMIS. Um, or excuse me, they were referred. Um, I was reading the question that came up. <laughs> I apologize. Um, they were uh, referred uh, for rapid rehousing services through coordinated entry, um, and she informs the rapid rehousing provider that her husband hit her and one of the children. She has no money and nowhere safe to go. And they both had significant bruises on their arms. So documentation of this would be um, the DV shelter stay is sufficient. Um, so again, um, having Rebecca sign something that says she is homeless due to, DV, due to domestic violence and have um, the DV shelter confirm that is, is the best way to go. Next slide. And then um, this talks about um, a situation where um, Susie left her home because her boyfriend hit her and she does not feel safe returning. And she has no money and nowhere to go. And she's currently staying with her mom and is being enrolled into a rapid rehousing program. So again, um, she would be considered fleeing even though she is staying with her mom. Um, and the caseworker certification is needed if safety is not jeopardized. So um, if she has been working with um, a DV agency, um, that would be another uh, easy way to get that certification. Um, 
and then uh, getting certification that no subsequent residents um, is available and lacks financial resources support um, could be done through uh, income verification and those sorts of things. So things that you would typically do to qualify someone for rapid rehousing, um, whether or not they were fleeing. Did we um, answer the question? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks. So for those of you who are not on the line um, uh, and or can't see the Skype chat box, um, there was a question submitted under what circumstances would a non-victim service provider obtain this documentation if we are prompted and forced by HMIS to immediately refer them to the local DV provider? Should we obtain this documentation if possible uh, before making the referral, or is it meant only in situations where the DV provider cannot work with the client? I love these questions, so thank you for submitting them. Um, uh, others should submit questions as well, please. We welcome, we welcome your questions. Um, uh, my response was just that this documentation is what's required for enrollment into COC-funded uh, projects. Um, so it. it Certainly, I think uh, to the degree that somebody comes into a general assessment center or a DV assessment center and has documentation in hand, um, I think that as a uh, matter of practice to you know, make copies and upload the, that documentation into uh, the coordinated entry HMIS portion makes sense. I, don't, I, I wouldn't recommend that for DV specifically, but I think as a general rule that makes sense. Um, uh, but this is specifically what a provider would need to have in place to verify eligibility for program enrollment for C a COC-funded project. So that was a really great question, and thanks for helping us to sort of make a point to um, specify uh, where these documentation requirements uh, apply. Um, I don't, so we're, if we're, I can add something, Lee, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, do. I don't mean to repeat myself or you, but um, I, I just want to make sure that everyone knows that that documentation should not be uploaded into HMIS under any circumstances for a survivor. The only way that that should happen is if a survivor has said that they have no confidentiality concerns within the HMIS system and they're happy to have everyone look at their information. Um, and they sign a release. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, did it, were you going to say something else? Nope, that's it. Okay. Um, okay, so we're going to move to the final portion of today's webinar, which is, um, so you're sort of getting three mini webinars in one here, um, uh, trying to stuff all of our good work around uh, DV and COC collaboration into one webinar. Um, so the third and final sort of component is the emergency transfer plan. We're going to sort of start broad and then move into the emergency uh, transfer plan. Um, by broad, I mean to talk first about HUD's VAWA final rule, which includes requirements for the emergency transfer plan, among other things. Um, so if you're not familiar with VAWA, uh, VAWA is the Violence Against Women Act. Um, the reauthorization of VAWA occurred in 2013. HUD implemented the VAWA final rule in November of 2016. Um, regulations went into effect the following month in December 2016, um, and then implementation uh, requirements began December 2017. So what I can say to you uh, about that is if you, if you go back to your HUD COC contract, um, uh, if you are a COC funded, and this is not this is good information, just so you know, for everybody uh, to hear. Uh, but this one little aspect is specific to COC funded uh, projects. If you go back to your HUD contract, there is likely some language around um, the emergency transfer plan or HUD's uh, VAWA final rule. Um, and we're going to talk about what, what some of that uh, was. Um, if, if it's not in your current contract, I would expect it to be in your next contract. It really depends on timing um, uh, in terms of when it was required through the NOFA and when you applied for that money, probably in 2018, your 2018 grant, um, and when your start date is. So 
folks at this point most likely have um, uh, begun their 2018 uh, grant funding, and this is so some of the information that we're going to review here, if you haven't already sort of taken action, it's something that you might want to consider and I would recommend. Um, so the for those of you following along without uh, access to the computer, we advance the slide, we're now on slide 23. Um, so language from uh, the COC interim rule, um, which was updated to incorporate HUD's uh, VAWA final rule. If you're not familiar with what the interim rule is, um, in 2012 HUD issued um, interim regulations uh, that they refer to as the interim rule. They have not been finalized yet. Um, uh, they keep telling us that it's just going to be a fabulous document once uh, it's finally uh, finalized um, and it is nonetheless remaining as an interim rule for the last seven and a half years. Um, uh, that being said, the if you look at section uh, 578.99 part J, um, protections for victims of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking, basically what this says is that these rules are applying to all permanent and transitional housing programs for which COC program funds are used. So regardless of um, the kind of project you're operating, um, uh, if you have received funding for acquisition, rehab, new construction, leasing, rental assistance, or operations costs. I just want to remind you that um, uh, this, uh, this rule uh, became uh, finalized in November 2016 with implementation 2017. Um, so if you have very old dollars that were used for acquisition, rehab, or new construction, um, uh, unless you have a newer uh, uh, contract from HUD for some reason, um, this would not apply. That doesn't mean that you can't participate, but you're not required in the same way that somebody receiving leasing, rental assistance, or operations dollars on an ongoing basis would be. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the HUD VAWA final rule includes a lot of information, probably enough information that we could have a full day face-to-face -face training um, uh, uh, on this uh, particular, on the various components of the rule. For the sake of time, um, it, honestly, if we had dedicated the full two hours to the components of the rule, we wouldn't have been able to get in to the weeds. Um, and so I would really encourage folks who are COC funded um, specifically to go back and ESG funded, frankly, uh, to go back and uh, do some additional reading on this. Um, within the last couple of slides of the PowerPoint, we have resources that are linked, including HUD has done two um, power, um, excuse me, two webinars uh, on this topic to date. Um, and has focused on many of these different components of the rules um, and has gone into more detail than we can go into during today's presentation. Um, that being said, we're going to highlight really three different uh, components of the rules, the notice of occupancy rights, um, and then the lease addendums and rental agreement, and then finally back into uh, the emergency transfer plan requirements. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, new requirements of COC funded providers. So I, I just want to review this really quickly so that when you see these words pop up in the next several slides, um, uh, you know that these are the kinds of things that HUD is looking for and expecting of, uh, uh, frankly, again, ESG and COC funded providers. So project participants should be provided with a VAWA notice of occupancy rights. Um, I'm not sure what happened to the S there, but um, nonetheless, uh, victim and a victim self-certification form. Um, landlords uh, that you're working with to implement your projects should be provided with a VAWA lease addendum. Uh, and we've got uh, the templates linked for those three documents, again, and the resources at the end of the PowerPoint. Um, and we'll go over, uh, over those uh, briefly. Next slide, please. So just to go into some more detail, notice of occupancy rights. This slide is very specific to COC. The next slide is going to be specific to ESG. 
So in the COC program, the VAWA notice of occupancy right and victim self-certification form must be given to a tenant by the recipient or the subrecipient under very specific circum um, or very specific times. First, when a program participant applies and is admitted um, to a housing program. Secondly, when an individual or household applies and is denied assistance uh, through the CO through a COC program. Third, when a program participant receives notification of eviction. And fourth, when that household or individual is notified of termination of their assistance through the COC. So at these different four different intervals, um, these forms should be provided uh, to the tenant. Um, in a tenant-based rental assistance program, it must also be given to the owner when a tenant receives an eviction. Um, that is directly from uh, the HUD language. I, it's not a lot I can say about uh, the timing or the intervals of these um, uh, different steps, but this is what uh, the expectation is uh, and requirements are from HUD. Um, next slide, please. So the notice of occupancy rights for folks being assisted through ESG resources is not that different. There's a slight nuance difference there for the first bullet when it says when a program participant begins receiving rental assistance. Again, it said upon application uh, um, uh, in the previous slide. So that's just a, a small nuance. And then the third bullet down um, also specifically talks about uh, project-based rental assistance as compared to uh, the pri prior slide talking about tenant-based rental assistance. So there's um, just a couple of nuances, but nonetheless, as you can see there, there's five different um, periods of time when uh, projects should be ensuring that uh, all households are receiving uh, these notifications. So the, the other thing I, I just want to mention is that um, when we talk about who is supposed to be given, for example, the notice of occupancy right, this isn't necessarily limited to, let me rephrase that, this is not limited to uh, individuals and households who are entering your program that have a history of domestic violence or they're, they're entering your project um, based on their eligibility under Category 4. This would be anybody um, uh, moving into the program, whether or not they've disclosed um, current or previous um, uh, DV um, experiences. Next slide, please. So we talked about um, th that's what is, is needed to uh, be distributed to uh, um, program participants in terms of landlords um, and housing uh, providers that, that you're working with. All agreements between the, the landlord or owner and the tenant in COC or um, uh, ESG assisted housing should be outlined in a VAWA lease addendum and must include the following elements. And as you can see there, there are five different elements. Right for the lease to be broken without penalty. If the, a transfer is required, again, we're going to talk about the transfer in just a moment. Um, but uh, uh, important point there, lease to be broken without penalty. Um, language that protects individuals from being denied access to housing or evicted from their housing on the basis of or as a direct result of being a survivor. Um, construction of lease terms in terms of assistance, limitation of VAWA protections, and then confidentiality requirements. So those are the five um, elements that need to be included in the VAWA lease addendum. Again, um, this is provided uh, at the end of the PowerPoint, uh, uh, the HUD template. Next slide, please. Rental agreements, um, ESG and COC uh, recipients must outline VAWA protections in all rental agreements, housing assistance contracts. Um, again, it, the, it includes the following requirements to include VAWA lease addendum uh, to all leases, which we just talked about, requirement um, to coordination on emergency transfers. That's a poorly uh, <laughs> constructed bullet point there. Um, requirement of coordination on emergency transfers is, is certainly what it should say. 
obligation for the owner to notify the recipient before a lease um, is bifurcated and or a notice of eviction is provided. And I'm going to talk about that just a little bit. Um, bifurcated lease is one of the things that HUD does talk about in the webinar that they do. Basically what this um, includes is if you have, for example, a family um, uh, of some sort in a unit, in a COC or ESG uh, funded unit, and um, one member of that family needs to leave the unit um, as a result of domestic violence or sexual assault or any of the other um, categories that are covered, um, it talks about how the, the lease is handled, meaning uh, some members of the household may remain in the current unit with other members of the household needing a safe new unit to live in. Uh, so HUD goes into some detail um, about that specifically. Um, for COC program, if a notice of eviction is given to a tenant, obligation uh, to provide both the notice of rights and self-certification form with that notice. So th some of this sort of overlaps the things that we talked about. We talked about that specifically um, uh, in the slide in terms of what needs to be provided to your tenants um, as opposed to the landlord or housing provider. Um, but that sort of summarizes uh, the various requirements. Next slide, please. Okay, so finally we're making it up. We're building, building, building up to talking about the emergency transfer plan um, as it's included in the interim rule. So a couple things. First it says, as you can see there, section uh, 578.7 part D, VAWA emergency transfer plan. The COC must develop the emergency transfer plan for the continuum of care that meets the requirements, and the mints just keeps falling off. I'm not sure. This is the second time I've typed it in, and uh, I don't know what's happening there. But regardless, if you can hand write it in if you want, but it's, uh, it should say the requirements. Um, and then um, what we're going to talk about, I just want to reassure folks, um, if you're sort of having um, uh, cold sweats and a little bit of panic over there, uh, that Section 578.51, Part M, um, talks about VAWA emergency transfer plan costs. And what it basically says is that COC funded um, organizations uh, can use their COC funding uh, to help cover the cost related to breaking the lease um, and uh, uh, implementing the transfer plan. So um, something just to know that uh, this, the, the resources that are allocated to your program already can be used to support uh, uh, this, these, these transfers. Next slide, please. So in response to these requirements, the Western PCOC developed an emergency transfer plan. If I say ETP, that just means emergency transfer plan. Um, so that participants in homeless assistance pro projects um, who need to flee or who are fleeing uh, can be safe and have access to stable housing. In accordance with VAWA, the Western PCOC um, programs, uh, homeless assistance programs, um, must allow uh, uh, participants to request an emergency transfer plan uh, to move from their current unit to another unit, either within an existing program or externally. And we're going to talk about what that means um, uh, specifically. The, the real, you know, one of the, the goals that really is not highlighted so much by HUD um, uh, in the, the regulation, but one of the things that they're looking to accomplish in this is to really help prevent households from experiencing further homelessness as a result of domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, human trafficking. Um, uh, and what I mean by that is if this is limited to folks who are already in our programs um, and if they are feeling like they're unsafe and they have to flee their current ESG or COC funded housing opportunity, um, will that eventually lead to additional homelessness uh, without the existence of an emergency transfer plan and these other requirements? The answer is it certainly could. Um, and so that's one of the things that uh, this work is really uh, seeking to do. Next slide, please. 
Brendan, can you advance the slide? I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, so the emergency transfer plan, ES, COC and ESG transfer plans um, must allow survivors of a VAWA-defined crime to transfer to a safe dwelling unit under a covered housing program if the survivor requests the transfer, the provider reasonably believes that they are um, threatened with imminent harm if they stay in the same unit, or in the case of sexual assault, if the sexual assault occurred on the premises within 90 days of the request of the transfer. So I just want to point out that's an and and an or there. So the request has to be transferred and either they have to, um, uh, the, the circumstances uh, need to be believed by the housing provider or in the case of sexual assault, um, uh, it can be uh, done sort of automatically if it's within 90 days. Um, Maria, I know there may, did you want to add anything about the sexual assault piece? Sure. Um, the reason why there's that 90 day qualification is that um, survivors of sexual assault often don't report. Um, and they certainly, if they do report, they don't report immediately. Um, and it may not even occur to them in the aftermath of an assault that they need um, to relocate um, because they are feeling traumatized by being um, in the same home um, or feel worried that they're um, the, the person that assaulted them may show up again. And so there's that 90 day period um, that is uh, given to survivors of sexual assault. So they have the time to be able to sort of reason out what's going to work best for them. Great. Thank you. Next slide, please. Okay, so survivor uh, uh, requests an emergency transfer plan using the self-verification form. You are an ESG or COC funded program. What do you do? So it, the answer really depends on the kind of housing program or programs that are operated by your organization. So if you operate, for example, a rental assistance program, and that household um, uh, or the individual uh, can stay in uh, the general area that, that your program is covered by. So what I mean by that is if you operate a program in Armstrong County and you only operate that project in Armstrong County and you don't have capacity or relationships in uh, any of the other uh, 19 counties um, uh, to be able to transfer somebody from your county to Potter County, let's say. Um, uh, I, in that case, you, you don't have the, the mechanism within your own individual uh, project to, to facilitate that move. If you did, if somebody were in, let's just stay with Armstrong County, and was living in a rapid rehousing project um, and renting an apartment, and they want to move across town um, and would feel safe in that situation then and you are serving all of Armstrong County of course um, then that is a move that you can facilitate internally um, meaning that you can because you're required to have um, the specific language of um, a lease addendum uh, with the landlord um, you can certainly break that lease if needed um, with the landlord in order to assist this household to move to a new unit um, you may find that the uh, some of the landlords that you're currently partnering with um, own multiple properties and they may allow you um, to facilitate this move um, uh, to one of their other units, assuming that the survivor is comfortable uh, and believes their safety um, uh, uh, is not at risk in that new unit. Um, it, it will look different most likely each time, but the important thing to know is that if you operate um, a tenant-based rental assistance program um, or through even leasing, depending on the circumstances of the project, most likely you can facilitate a move, um, an emergency transfer request internally with your, um, uh, your program resources. 
if you have, let's say you have a site-based program and you only have one building um, and that's your only uh, uh, program for providing homeless assistance, in that case, unless the survivor says, I'm currently in Unit 101, but if I lived in, current, in, in Unit 201 or in some other unit within that building, um, I would be safe. I just can't live within these four walls um, with this other individual any longer um, and maintain my safety. In that case, assuming you have an opening, you could certainly move that individual to a new unit based on what they've said um, they would still be they would feel safe um, and uh, if they if you did not have an open unit however you would need to access external resources to be able to um, facilitate that move or help facilitate that move I should say um, similarly if the uh, if the survivor said I can't live in the same building with um, with this individual I need more more distance than that then and this is the only uh, building that you have, then obviously you would also need to look at an external transfer type of situation. And we're going to talk some more about what, what that really means. Um, another option is, and I, I'll just point out that um, we, we understand the hope here is that um, folks recognize that someone's safety is at imminent risk, and that's why this is happening. Um, we also know that um, it's not always immediate or easy to find um, uh, available rental units. Um, we know that you have to do uh, an inspection uh, to sure, ensure that the unit passes um, HUD quality standards if that's not already been done uh, in that unit um, and documented. Uh, and so there is, a there is a process that has to occur, even if the process happens um, expeditiously, it's still a process. And so in those circumstances, it may be that the survivor needs some sort of safe and or available unit. Um, uh, uh, perhaps that's with friends and family. Perhaps that is in a DV shelter if needed. Perhaps some other type of situation. Um, what I would really encourage is if the survivor is open to working with uh, the local DV provider, um, that it really be a three-way conversation if possible where the DV provider would be brought in as part of that to say, okay, we're going to um, look for an internal or external transfer, but where are you going to be tonight? Um, how are we going to make sure that you're safe now? Um, those kinds of conversations um, should certainly be facilitated um, at the local level uh, and like I said, with the DV organization, if the if the household is open to collaboration with that, and if they sign a release of information, giving everybody permission to talk to each other. Um, so, just sort of trying to to summarize all of this again. If you have the ability within your project to transfer. Um, a household like through rapid rehousing or some type of tenant-based rental assistance, you would do that based on approval of the request um, using an internal transfer option. I would encourage you to really talk to the landlords that are part of your program um, about this change and to, to educate them so that they understand if, um, if you do have to come to them with this, um, uh, what you know where it's coming from, what their, uh, what the law requires, et cetera, um, and hopefully, uh, at least for some of your landlords, if not all, um, they can really be partners in and implementing this change. Um, if you do not have the ability because of the structure of your program to move somebody from Unit A to Unit B, then you're going to need to request an external transfer, and we're going to talk about what that would look like in just a moment. And then in terms of immediacy, um, how is somebody going to access um, something that is available and safe in the short term? Next slide, please. So um, I, I just want to emphasize that what we're talking about here, it, this, is not, this is the beginning of a conversation and certainly not the end. And this is the case for a number of reasons. One is that the Eastern PCOC's emergency transfer plan um, ne already needs updates. 
So the plan was finalized earlier this year, um, and we've already identified a couple things that um, need to be revised. So the emergency transfer plan is posted on the website, but please know that um, it needs to be it needs some updates to really add some additional um, details around procedure, how this uh, plan will be uh, implemented using coordinated entry as part of um, uh, the solution to, to honoring and, and processing emergency transfer plan requests. So the other thing to know when you read this um, uh, emergency transfer plan, if you haven't already, is that there's currently no specific timelines requiring the housing provider to accept or reject the emergency transfer request within a specific number of days, nor are there timelines to complete the transfer. Um, that's something that I can tell you that we're really hoping um, uh, to Im implement through the revised version. Um, uh, the, the goal here is not to be punitive or anything like that, but to really um, emphasize the need for expediency uh, in these, these situations because somebody's safety is, is is on the line. Um, so uh, the the other thing I just want to mention too is if you have to request an external um, trans emergency transfer request, um, that is going to be facilitated through the coordinated entry process. Um, as of right now, there is a live JOT form, and I've provided the the link there um, uh, on the screen. It's also in the handouts, um, uh, and it's also on the, um, I believe it's on the resources slide as well. Um, and so what will happen is that uh, if you did need to request an external transfer, you would go to this JOT form uh, access there, and you would indicate your name and contact information. You would indicate just a few different details, like how many bedrooms are needed, um, what community um, has been identified as a safe community for that individual, um, and I think one other thing that I'm, I'm forgetting off the top of my head, um, uh, the preferred location, oh, the type of unit, whether or not the individual is currently in, um, oh, Kathy Presner just wrote number of bedrooms. Number of bedrooms is one, thank you, Kathy, um, and the type of unit. So if the, the individual is currently in a rapid rehousing project versus a permanent supportive housing uh, program. Um, we recognize that there is less turnover of permanent supportive housing beds um, than rapid rehousing. Um, and so, you know, all of that will be considered as we look to um, facilitate emergency transfers quickly. For example, it could be that somebody who's currently in permanent supportive housing may need to be transferred to a rapid rehousing program as an interim step until um, a permanent supportive housing unit in that community became available. Um, we can certainly, as these situations start occurring, talk about eligibility, but in general, um, the, if somebody was eligible when they were enrolled into a project, they're going to maintain their eligibility um, to sort of transfer back and forth across these projects um, to ensure um, uh, uh, their safety. Um, as specific circumstances, though, uh, come up, we can certainly discuss that. The other thing that I want to say in regards to the updates to the emergency transfer plan is that this is brand new. And so we're creating this plan and these procedures in a very sort of theoretical, hypothetical type of context. And I, I really would like to encourage you, you all, um, if you're involved in the coordinated entry committee or if you're involved in the DV coordinated entry um, uh, committee that Maria spoke about earlier, or if you uh, attend your RAB meetings, or if you want to send an email to, to our office um, at the COC's email address, which is westerncoc at pennsylvaniacoc.org, I would really encourage you to keep us sort of in the loop so that we can learn more. Um, uh, as we learn how frequently these emergency transfer plan requests um, are happening, um, what the barriers to uh, um, fulfilling these requests are, um, uh, what additional resources are needed, what additional um, training is needed, 
Are there forms that we can help create that can be used across the entire COC, um, et cetera, et cetera? I think that if we continue to have sort of a two-way conversation around the emergency transfer plan um, process, that we can really help to sort of nail down a really tight process and hopefully ensure that everyone has um, a thorough understanding, the documents needed to expedite this uh, and to sort of take some of the burden um, off of you and, and, and instead have a more standardized uh, system to, uh, to facilitate these, these uh, transfers. Next slide, please. So um, households awaiting an external transfer through coordinated entry are to be prioritized for the next available unit for which they are eligible. So some of this, um, some of the, um, the other way this is likely to sort of change and evolve is, um, is how this looks on coordinated entry, for example, on the prioritization list. Right now, you won't see anybody who's waiting for an emergency transfer plan on the prioritization list. You may never. Um, that's part of what uh, a, a working group is talking about right now. Um, but the important thing to know is that if somebody is requesting uh, an emergency transfer plan, they're going to be prioritized over other people. So, for example, if they are it, I, I don't know the numbers. If somebody has 150 on the waiting list and they're number one, and tomorrow somebody requests an emergency transfer plan, um, they're going to be the number one prioritized person um, uh, based on uh, what types of projects they're eligible for. They're certainly not going to be enrolled into a project where they are not eligible, um, but it, they would be the first uh, household assign that resource, again, sort of considering community, um, type of project, number of bedrooms, all of those factors that are going to be collected um, uh, through the JOT form, uh, this household would be prioritized. And the idea there is that um, this is a life-threatening situation. I certainly agree with the logic that homelessness in general, if someone is unsheltered, and I don't know about where you are, I would assume it's the same. It is very cold today. It's very wet and damp and cold um, and dark, and it it certainly is a life sort of threatening situation to imagine somebody unsheltered tonight. Um, hopefully that individual can be connected to emergency shelter um, because certainly the, this household too uh, is also in a life threatening situation um, also uh, would be uh, prioritized in, in this case above that individual. Um, the other point here is that if a participant re reasonably believes a proposed transfer would not be safe, the participant may request a, a transfer to a different unit. So as I mentioned before, the job form asks about which communities the individual is looking to transfer to. Obviously, that may need to be a two-way conversation. If somebody wants permanent supportive housing in Potter County, we don't have any there. Um, and so that is uh, a conversation that would have to occur. Um, uh, but the, you know, the goal is to connect uh, the individual uh, who needs to flee uh, with the, the right resource in the right community to really um, uh, uh, facilitate that move, ensure their safety, and ensure that they're receiving, uh, to the degree possible, the level of uh, supportive services that they need. Um, again, this states, I've already said this, but this also states that um, the program participant cannot move into a project for which they're ineligible. Next slide, please. So a quick summary of the implementation requirements that, are, um, that have been sort of discussed today. Again, this is a segment of the HUD VAWA rule. This is not inclusive of every single requirement um, that's within that rule. I would really encourage you um, to, uh, to dive more deeply into this using the HUD webinar and to ask questions. Um, if you read something that you don't understand, please ask us if, um, you know, if there's some way that we can um, help to uh, continue this conversation and support uh, these efforts. I know I would like to continue to be engaged in that, and I would assume that Maria would feel the same way. Um, so the things that we've talked about, project participants should be provided with um, the VAWA notice of 
uh, occupancy rights, as well as the self-certification form, landlords should be provided with the VAWA lease addendum. Um, if, if tomorrow this happens, to request an emergency transfer plan, um, this JOT form will notify uh, the folks at LCAP um, uh, who are working on coordinated entry, uh, and they will be able to reach out to you and, and uh, help move things uh, forward and to uh, quickly uh, respond to that request. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a couple of links um, to resources that I've mentioned. Um, first and foremost, the current version of the emergency transfer plan is listed there. Um, the next three documents are um, things that we've talked about today, and these are just the HUD templates, um, a VAWA notice of occupancy rights, a victim self-certification form, and a VAWA lease addendum. I will tell you that the uh, victim uh, self-certification form, um, Maria and I worked together to um, uh, uh, modify uh, HUD's form uh, to make it more specific to uh, the COC in the East, uh, and that's a conversation that we intend to have uh, with the, the work group currently looking at the emergency transfer plan. Um, so if that is uh, done in the West as well, we'll certainly push those uh, documents and resources out to you. In addition to that, uh, if, we, if this group decides to look at the notice of occupancy rights and the lease addendum and we create a COC um, version of the HUD template, we will certainly uh, push that out to you as well. Next slide, please. I've mentioned a couple times that HUD has done two webinars um, uh, for um, uh, the, the, the VAWA housing protections. Um, that uh, apply to ESG and COC funded projects. Uh, these are the two. These are links to those two webinars. Um, if you if you go, there's access to um, the recorded webinar. You can also view uh, the transcript if that's easier than watching a webinar just to read it. Um, and I think only one of them has the actual slides. But uh, in the case. Uh, in most cases, the, the transcript or the recording of the webinar is more valuable anyway um, to get really more details. Um, they, they also have written documentation um, uh, on, on the HUD exchange um, beyond just these two webinars, but th these two webinars really seem like the best starting place to um, further and expand uh, knowledge and awareness of the, the changes that uh, HUD is expecting. So with that, I will um, say next slide, please, and ask if there's any questions, or Maria, if there's anything that you wanted to add in. I know I just kept, I didn't pause for, for you to jump in over the last several slides, but if there's something that you wanted to add uh, as well. I'm not sure if you're talking, but if you want. I, I don't have anything to add, thanks. Oh, okay, great. I do know there was one other question. Will clients requesting an emergency transfer have placement priority over other clients waiting on the HMIS prioritization list? That question may have been asked before I said that. Um, the answer is, is yes, uh, uh, if they're eligible for the resource. So you're not going to have somebody who is, if you're a permanent supportive housing provider and, and somebody requesting an emergency transfer is in rapid and you're looking to enroll somebody you're not necessarily going to, to have to priority place that individual. Um, if they were also eligible for permanent supportive housing, I'm not sure, though. Uh, I, I think at this point it would probably be that they would still go into rapid rehousing. Um, if that situation occurs and there's some actual questions and not just me sitting here thinking about anything and everything that could go wrong with this policy, um, please let us know and we can certainly think that through in the future. Any other questions? Okay. So um, as I mentioned, uh, please keep us in the loop. Um, uh, I know I would love to hear 
um, once a an emergency transfer plan uh, request is submitted, um, how it went and what went well and what did not go well, and how we can really look to build uh, this process and support the process further. Um, uh, as questions come up um, about eligibility or process or whatever, um, please feel free to reach out to um, to me via the COC's email address. Um, please don't write directly to my email address because I'm out of the office often and, and I may not see your message uh, in a timely way. Um, uh, but please feel free to reach out to our office and to, uh, to Maria for support as needed. Thanks to everybody for participating today and thanks to Brendan for um, helping to facilitate and thanks to my co-presenter Maria Williams from PCADB. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Leah and Maria. Take care, everyone. Peace.